Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Veteran Voices in Code. I am here today with another alumni, Jose Delgado, talking about, well, talking about all sorts of interesting things. We might get into software engineering and how that meets up with the world of DevOps and uh, all sorts of things. So but before we start, uh, well, before we start with the more technical questions, Jose, I like to start with a traditional question now, which is, what made you raise your right hand? What made you say, yep, I want to go serve in the military? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Greg. So my dad was a Marine. Um, he was infantry for eight years uh, until he got out to take care of me. And he just, at, from then on, he worked in law enforcement as a U.S. Marshal and then at the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Brunswick, Georgia. So kind of from an early age, I wanted to kind of fill in his shoes and stuff or do some kind of service, whether it be firefighter as a kid or what I ended up choosing, which was um, military. Um, my college, or not my college, sorry, my high school had a great J. Rossi program. And I didn't want to do it at first, but parents were like, hey, listen, you like strictness, you like regiments, try it for one year. Uh, and then if you don't like it, you try it, you can do whatever you want. And I ended up loving it, started sophomore year, went the rest of the three years, and was fortunate enough to earn the Navy ROTC scholarship to the Citadel. So uh, that kind of solidified that hey, you're going to be, you're definitely going to be serving from here on out. But always raised around it, and I was always uh, loving it. The moment I stepped foot in that J. Rossi classroom, that's great. That's great. So join the Navy. What did you do in the Navy? In the Navy, I was a cryptologic warfare officer. Uh, I did signals intelligence and support to national operations. Fantastic. And and you may be aware or may not that we have a lot of overlap with people from similar backgrounds. Um, linguistics, cryptological warfare, those kinds of things. There seems to be a, a gravitation towards code platoon. So draw that connection for me. You, you're getting out of the Navy. You decide, hey, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend 25, 30 years in this. Uh, I want to get out. I want to go into, draw that map out for me. How did you get here? How did you get to code platoon? Yeah. So uh, one of my tours was at the National Security Agency. And while there, of course, you can't talk, obviously can't talk much about it, but um sure. I was able to dip my hands into um, tailored asset development. And I was like, you know what? This engineering thing is actually kind of cool. Um, my degree is in it in computer science. So I'd already been exposed to it and had an idea of what I want to do. But at that point, I was still looking career. Um, but kind of as I just aged up, I was like, you know, am I going to do Navy for 20 years? I'm hitting the six year mark. Or am I going to get out and, you know, before I hit 30, start a new career field and go forward? So uh, thinking back, I really did enjoy my work with the NSA. So I figured, hey, I'd like to have a job, one that I could talk about, and two, that revolves around software engineering. So um, it, while well, I was on deployment in uh, 2022, I mean, you know, you're, you're helping me out while uh, I was over <laughs> in Greece, taking my yeah. calls with horrible reception, everything. <laughs> um, I applied for Co-Platoon. I pulled the trigger, said, hey, I want to get ready to get out. Um, and yeah, the rest is history. February, I started my skill bridge and then followed it into terminal leave and thankfully gainful employment at my current employer. Great. So there's two subjects there that I think that are worth exploring because we have a lot of people in, in a similar situation now or coming in the future. So there's a couple of things there. First, uh, let's, let's hit on the skill bridge topic real quick. What for future, future students, skill bridge? You're telling somebody now who's thinking about skill bridge, what's your 30 second elevator speech on? I wish I had known to help their process be better in the future. Yep. Yeah, so uh, skill bridge DOD supported program that allows veterans to transition successfully uh, into the civilian world and get gainful employment. Uh, my wish I had known is that I had, know about it in general um it's probably the dod's best kept secret <laughs> agree i didn't know about it until the signals warfare officer that i was replacing was leaving and he was like yeah i'm taking a skill bridge and i immediately went what is that <laughs> and he told me about it and i guess that's a little step in the catalyst of huh i'll just keep that back in my mind for them to get an out and he actually helped me out through it but yeah it's it's honestly after you take in the navy it's called taps your transition assistance program um this is skill bridge is absolutely phenomenal puts you in contact with net uh with people and places and it's it's just phenomenal it gets you skills that you originally didn't have that you want to go into i you agree enough i talk agree to your sevens and talk to your officers get that stuff going if you are uh, thinking about getting out 
Agreed. And if you're coming across this video sometime in the future, you've already done it or something like that, please share it with with others who are not yet out. Because one of the biggest problems with Skillbridge, you already noted, is just knowing about it, knowing that it exists, knowing that that's a potential. Um, I got out in 2009. I don't think it existed then, but if it did, I certainly didn't know about it. So it wasn't until I came to Code Platoon that I knew about it at all. Another subject you touched on there, and this is a this is a big one that we get. So I'm curious as to your thoughts. You said you had a, already had a degree in computer science. Tell me what's the advantage of each. So obviously you've already got a computer science background. You come to Code Platoon. What do you see of the and try, you know I'm not looking for a, a hit piece on on computer science degree programs. So what's the what's the upside of each one of those, and what do you see the advantages, maybe disadvantages of each one being? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll start off with if you go in with a degree, since that's what I'm familiar with. So you go in with a degree, you're already going. You should have a foundation in software and how computers work, right? So we talk about stuff like literal strings, booleans, all that stuff, typing, object orientation, all that jazz. Uh, someone coming in from the outside does not have exposure, might get confused by a lot of the concepts starting out, and but having at least having been exposed to it previously, not even with a degree, just having previous exposure um you already have some sort of familiarity so even if you don't completely understand it um you have the capability to att uh, attribute concepts to each other and kind of uh conceptualize information that way um if you're coming in without a degree that's kind of why i like uh, skill bridge copathoon specific um you're a lot more reliant on the professor or on the instructors and your uh, colleagues, but at the same time, you're more of a sponge. Uh, if you get exposed to so much material, maybe um, you had a degree, uh, you have a degree, and you kind of, I don't know, maybe you learn incorrectly, or you had poor, um, poor experiences for actual software implementation after you got your degree, and then you decided to take SkillBridge and Copeltoon and all that. Um, it can cause, I guess you call it mental conflict. Uh, there, there's sure. a better term I know, but to, or to learning conflict, just the information you already have doesn't match up with what you're learning and it causes an innate sense of confusion on, okay, have I been doing things right? Are they teaching me wrong? And it's that confidence. It, it, it's a, it can be debilitating your confidence. Um, sure. sure. Yeah. I think uh, cognitive dissonance is maybe the term you're looking for. Yes. There. It's a com Thank common, you, <laughs> common term that's thrown out that's often misunderstood. And for those curious, cognitive dissonance is actually a good thing. It's actually a, a positive thing. A lot of people see it as a, a bad thing, but it's actually how we learn. We come across two conflicting pieces of information that creates cognitive dissonance. It's that discomfort that we try to reconcile. That's where we learn. That's where we learn the most. So it, I think it's a good thing. Now, I've heard conflicting things on this subject, so I'm curious as to your take. Some who have had a computer science degree came through our program, and they've noted that what Code Platoon provided for them was the was a, a lot more practical, hands-on application of the learning, rather than simply just the theoretical model building, something like that. Is it was that your experience? Is that accurate? Inaccurate? Needs caveats. To an extent, I I'd, I'd probably agree with that sentiment. Um, Code Platoon definitely hands-on. Uh, I. I guess I'd be a little biased because since I already knew some of the background of. I don't know, the accessibility of the information uh, to say whether or not it truly helped in any significant capacity. Um, but yeah, I do believe Copeland focuses more on the practical sense. With that being said, though, a lot of the instructors did focus on a lot of the basic level uh, conceptual information. So again, object orienta uh, orientation structures, and you're dealing with multiple languages, JavaScript, type, slash TypeScript, um, Python, uh, and while you don't get into any low-level languages, they're still they're samey enough to where you can pick them up and kind of say, okay, this is similar. Here's how I go. But they're different enough to where you're going to have to learn two different structures for different languages and their implementations. So I, I don't consider that a negative on Copeltoon for being more of a practical sense. I think it's right. actually more important because then any questions you have, I mean, while you're in your Skillbridge program, you have the entirety of the internet to say, hey, why does this work like something that your instructor can't cover? Or if you're or during TA hours, you can go ahead and get that answered and just start asking questions. 
Absolutely. And I, I have, I've maintained that for quite some time now since I've been part of Code Platoon is that, you know, by no means are we disparaging of the, you know, the degree pathway or that as a model. Uh, but in terms of starting your career and having that hands-on application knowledge, I think, you know, this is a very solid method of learning what you need to do to be a junior software engineer. So moving forward, you've been out now a couple of years. You've been out of Code Platoon, what, two years now? What did you start out? Just one. Okay. Couldn't remember exactly. So what did you start out doing? Is it the same thing you're doing now or have you transitioned into something else? Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to uh, interview with my current company about a month after Code Platoon co uh, concluded and I was actually able to get employment with them and I'm still with them to this day. Uh, so that was, again, I was, ex I feel like I was extremely fortunate in that fact. I know a couple of friends who went through and it took until around the six month mark, not to their fault, but it's just kind of like job market fluctuates. Yeah, it does happen. No, absolutely. So what did, what was your, what, what was your starting role? And uh, just give us kind of the elevator speech version of what you're doing now and how that's, uh, like I said, just a synopsis of what you're doing now, I guess. Yeah, so I started out as an associate engineer on the cloud engineering team at my company. And basically my job was to start working on cloud infrastructure for DOD customers that we had contracts with. Um, as time progressed, I was able to get certifications and learn enough to become a software engineer and be put with the software engineer team itself, which was essentially um, now instead of just focusing on cloud infrastructure, I'm creating full stack solutions for the uh, for a customer, depending on what they want in their own phase. I'm sorry, I'm using very generic terms, um, yeah. proprietary information, all that, all that stuff. Oh, no, so, that's fine. Um, but in a sense, I'm, I'm just helping, I'm helping customers take what they want or describe what they want, put it into requests. And then from there, create a solution that will work in whatever environment they're in, where it's classified, unclassified, federal, what have you. I understood. A lot of fun. I love it. Yeah. That's great. That's great to hear. And that's, that's exactly what we want to hear from people. They made the right choice to do this. So you, what you're talking about there, I think speaks to kind of what you and I started this conversation with on Slack. Uh, we all, a year and a half ago, we started a DevOps program. There is a lot of questions out there on what is the difference between DevOps, cloud engineering, software engineering. You started obviously as a software engineer, but what you're doing kind of butts up against that world of cloud engineering, DevOps. Give us the kind of the synopsis of what you would say to someone who says, well, what's the difference? What What is a DevOps engineer versus a software engineer? What's your take on that? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Ooh. Uh, so software engineer, you can really think of as boots on the ground. I'm, you're the technician, you're engineer, you're creating the solutions, you're working on what's given to you. Uh, where DevOps engineer is still doing the uh, the technical work. However, now their focus is split between strictly technical and also dealing with manage, uh, management teams. So contracts, operations, maybe customers. Um, as an engineer, like even right now, I'm not, like I'm gearing up, we, we call them senior software engineers, not necessarily DevOps, but they do everything, but the senior software engineer encapsulates everything that a DevOps engineer would do. Um, and that's basically as a software engineer, I want to be told, hey, here's the solution. Maybe I'm working with my team saying, how should we best tailor it? How sh what language should we work? What framework should we employ? Or employ? Um, that's what I want to focus on. But as a DevOps engineer or a senior engineer, I want to be able to help out where I can on the technical side, but I want to make sure that all my software engineers have the tools and information they need to keep progressing their work. And that's where the software life, uh, software development life cycle comes in and agile methodologies and scrumming, all that stuff. That's where that stuff starts to play. It's in that DevOps side. And you can employ that at the lower level with software engineering with maybe a localized, hey, here's the ticket I'm the tickets I'm working on. Here's how I'm gonna format my time. But it really shines when you're managing, when you're an engineer managing engineers and you're you're kind of in charge to make sure everything's running smoothly. No, that makes that makes sense. So I'm gonna throw an analogy at you because I, I like to put things in in the context of people's backgrounds as much as possible because I think 
that's where I come in at Code Platoon. I'm not a software engineer. I'm not a DevOps engineer. I'm a, I'm a recruiter, right? So I have to kind of bridge that gap. And so obviously we're dealing with a, almost exclusively military community. Here's the analogy I, I sometimes use, and I, and I want you to tell me where I'm wrong and how, how this is inaccurate, or maybe it is accurate. In the military, right, we've got new products, new gear that we use. You were in the Navy, so let's assume that the Navy needs a new uh, a new version of an F-18, right? We'll, we'll use a Top Gun analogy because that's a cool movie. <laughs> when, why not, right? So they need a new F-18. They're going to go to uh, McDonnell Douglas and say, hey, we need a new plane. And the engineers are going to start building that plane and designing that plane. But somebody has to bring that plane to the Navy pilots and say, all right, fly this thing and tell me what's wrong. And I'll go back and talk to the engineers about what is wrong and we can make it better. Is that an accurate analogy of what a DevOps engineer essentially is? Yeah, essentially. Uh, you also captured in there essentially what your management and contracts are going to be working with. And when they go to the Navy and say, hey, what kind of plane do you want? How fast should it fly? What capabilities should it have? And then they're going to communicate, uh, those admin teams are going to communicate with your DevOps engineers and your lead engineers to say, hey, here's what's being solicited. What do you, do you see anything wrong here? And they're going to turn those requirements into actionable uh, tickets or workflows for the engineers to actually do. So yeah, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head. That's great. So I, I, it's good to hear because I don't want to be feeding people inaccurate information, but in that context and kind of making that same analogy, that DevOps person has to have an understanding of both worlds. And I, I think that's important for people to understand who are maybe outside and trying to think about how to get into this field is that you can't just be a pure engineer and you can't just be a pure, you know, work with a client type person. You kind of have to have the ability to do both. Is that an accurate take on that? If you're DevSecOps, I would say, I would say yes. Because again, if you don't know how to, if you don't have people's skills and you're not willing to learn it, I mean, you, you can be a great engineer then. But when you're DevSec, you've got to be able to talk with the customer. You have to be able to, in a tactful manner, tell them, hey, this is a poor decision. Uh, here are the reasons why. However, here's what your end goal is. So here's what my recommendation is. With the knowledge of, hey, if the customer wants to spend the money and still have it done anyways, it's all right. Well, it's going to be frustrating, but I'll turn it into a workflow. So, <laughs> Right. And it's from DevSec. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> And it's important to note too, for anybody who stumbles upon this conversation or is listening uh, to understand that what, what we're talking about here may vary from company to company, as I understand it, because you might get a different answer with somebody who works in this in a different area of the industry, right? So don't just take one definition. I learned this early on at Code Platoon. There are people who will swear up and down that a software engineer and a software developer are the exact same thing. And there are people out there who will say, no, these are different roles. So, you know, take, always take this into consideration that you might have different definitions that vary a bit from place to place. So uh, along that note, so that, and now we're diving more into the eminently practical aspect of that. DevOps, is that a place then, given all of what we've said so far, is DevOps even a good place to start a career or should it be started at the software engineering? Is that a better kind of a, a training ground, as it were, to become into that world of, of DevOps rather than just saying, I'm going to start out as DevOps because that seems like it fits me. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, honestly, I'd... It's a really weird answer. Uh, the question, the answer is maybe, and I hate using no yes or no's, <laughs> but the reason is because no matter what, you're going to be learning some other, uh, a different side entirely anyways. If you start as a software engineer, you're going to have to learn how to interface with customers if you want to go to dex, DevSec and vice versa. Maybe you were a project manager and you want to be a DevSec engineer, right? You're going to have to learn software so that you can communicate with your engineers and the engineering team. So no, regardless, the, I don't think the question is, or I don't think the answer should be tailored as yes, it's an easy start because you have to know, or no, or no, it's not an easy start because you have to know both. Um, it's can you learn a completely different field that will relate to your current job mm. or your current job interest? And that's really going to determine how easy it is to start out as a DevSecOps engineer. 
Uh, if you're an F, I don't know, like in the Navy, if you're an FCA chief, you've been managing Aegis weapon systems, right? Sure. Um, you if you end up getting out, you work with a subcontractor that works with DoD companies. You bring all that information on the capabilities of Aegis, and while you don't know software engineering, you can speak to DoD customers that pr probably DON, Department of the Navy, and turn get solicit uh, their requests, and then work with a senior engineer and say, hey. How do I get this turned into actual items to where, that your team can use? And that's DevSecOps. <laughs> like, <laughs> as long as you're being that interconnecting point, that's like that's DevSec. That's under the umbrella. So, like, to kind of summarize, depending on your background, it can be either very easy or very difficult to be a DevSec engineer. But you don't necessarily need to have exposure to both sides to be a good DevSec engineer. Fair. Oh, I think that was a good, good summary. Um, and, and I, you know, of course I ask this because a lot of people are asking these questions, you know, where, where do I best fit and things like that. And that here again, there seems to be a, some varied answers depending on who you talk to, but I think that was a, a rather robust answer. So uh, connected to that, although not, maybe not directly, but uh, a popular topic on everyone's mind right now, um, AI, AI development, you know, first of all, how does it impact you in what you're doing right now? And second, tie in the question of the, the famous phrase, it's taking our jobs or it's taking the jobs of software engineers. What are you seeing and how it relates to exactly what you've been talking about? And what do you see this moving forward in terms of job opportunities and the reality of this market? Yeah, so uh, there's actually a fun reflection moment because about a year ago, I did a... Uh, um, I did a coding podcast where I, I believe I was like, uh, I don't like AI. I'm not going to use it in my repo. Um, jump cut in a year. I'm older. I'm more mature. I've learned so much in the world. Um, I love it. I think AI is a phenomenal tool. Um, I still stand by that you can tell someone who uses AI as a tool versus a crutch. Um, that difference being, can you, if, I don't know, maybe your network goes down, but you still have your IDE up. Can you still bang out some code? Can you still at least write a boilerplate method? Do you understand what it does? If so, cool, use AI to your heart's content, but don't. you need to remember your fundamentals so you can explain it to either the younger engineers coming up or to an executive that's going down. That's a little beside the point. Um, when it comes to AI, I've been loving to see it expand. Our companies embrace AI. Um, they actually encourage us to use it to, um, to have impact on our workflow to tell them, Hey, does it speed up? Does it slow down? I've used it personally on uh, like getting, creating quick study guides on new frameworks I'm learning or new languages. Um, even some deprecated ones I'm trying to do because shout to the DOD, right? <laughs> um, it's, it's been phenomenal. Instead of Googling around running through stack overflow forums and pulling all that together, uh, it, 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 it aggregates it for you. So I, I don't take it, at face value, I don't use it as a full, full, full uh, fully sided search. I use it as a launching point for whatever I'm trying to go down. Um, do I think it will replace jobs currently? No. Um, I've seen the code it spits out. If, unless you're very, very, very specific, um, cool. It can create an HTML web page. It, 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 it can give you some components to React it's not going to, it currently cannot do the integration piece for it. It can build out entire full stack web app or full stack web application with consideration to environmental constraints. Maybe you're in a CUI environment. And so you can't use certain libraries. You can't use open source libraries. Maybe Maybe you're in a classified environment. You can't use libraries in general. Um, there's a lot of, or like external libraries in general. So it's not good for very specific use cases like that. But um, I don't know if you've seen Philip DeFranco on YouTube. That's where I get my daily source of news. He says it whenever he covers AI, he says it the best that anyone could ever say it. And that's AI today is as bad as it will ever be. <laughs> it's going to get better. Sure. It, that's just technological sure. progress. Sure. But I think it's best used when side by side with a person who can determine the nuances of the human thought, human characteristics. Fair point. Fair point. So, Again, I like to, you know, I'll I'll use another military analogy, but I'll draw on my background this time. And I was an infantryman to start out with, but I I can tell, you know, I tell everybody all the time, and it's not really joking. I qualified expert with a mop and a broom way before I was an expert with a rifle, right? 
I spent so much time mopping and cleaning because that's what the infantry does. Like everything's clean and perfect, right? It has to be. My perspective is what you're saying here about AI is that it kind of it kind of is like taking the mop and the broom away from the infantryman. He doesn't. He still has the core job of being an infantryman. He's still got to put heavy weight on his back and march to the objective and you know conquer the objective. But now he's not cleaning the barracks as much because the the broom and the mop is taken by a robot. Is that is that a fair analogy or not quite? Um, I'd say more if you're infantryman, uh, you have an M4 and you have a red dot sight on it. Can you fire with the red dot sight? Yes. Does it make your life easier? Does it make hitting the target harder or easier? Yes. But if your red dot sight break, breaks, can you still operate your weapon? Can you still use good old iron sights and take out, uh, hit a target 40 yards out? Yes. Then you're fine. That's, I can AI to the red dot sight. Mm, okay. Um, event, eventually, maybe it'll be a sea whiz and I'll just see something and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> technology progresses but that's up to the engineers and the companies to progress with it and see how they can integrate it and use it to boost themselves no that's fair it's fair so you know right now and i think that's an apt way of looking at things an apt analogy is that it's a tool right it's a it's an enhancing tool more so than a replacing tool um but as you said you know it's worst is today and it's going to get better and better and better. What uh, fast forward five years? Just your speculative take on it. What are we? What are we seeing five years from now? Um, I know at the very least, probably an expectation on stuff like GitHub Copilot integration onto your IDEs, right? Uh, if you don't know what that is, basically it helps you fill in reusable, uh, reusable or uh, frequently used code snippets. So instead of using an entire for loop constantly, uh, it will probably autofill it based on the context of your application. Um, it's I think that would probably end up being the bare minimum of understanding what to do or how to use things. And probably in five years, you're going to see more of a shift in expectations from executive to senior level management versus engineers using AI. Um, mm -hmm. Especially as AI becomes more robust, this will get this gives companies just the capability of, hey, now our engineers can learn uh, XYZ frameworks, which is the maybe it's the newest web app framework or newest database uh, querying language. Um, they can use ChatGPT 5.0 at this point uh, and, and learn how to do it real quick. So I want you, team lead, to create a test implementation, um, let's know, or talk to management and see what other data you can use to manage maybe our financials and deliver me a database that allows me to pull our financials within, I don't know, one second refresh rate or something like that. Like it, it just gives, it gives the flexibility with the asterisk of don't over over stress your engineers with a bunch sure. of new stuff because you think it's a good idea. Sure. But that's kind of where I think AI, I don't think AI will be too different. I just think it'll be more integrated. Mm. No, that makes sense. And probably into a lot more areas of life, just like computers became. I mean, I, I'm a kid of the 70s and the 80s, and I can tell you, you know, like computers were kind of a novelty back in the 80s. Uh, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, cool. You have a computer. So what? You know, and now it's everything. It's everything that we do. So backing out now, since we only have about nine minutes left, we're going to back out a little bit bigger picture. You you meet somebody who's considering Code Platoon. You're talking to somebody right now who's considering this future. What do you tell them? What's your what's your elevator pitch on what to do, things to consider? What do you what do you say to that person? Talk with them, your command, get your ducks in a row, and go do it. Like <laughs> genuinely, uh, ge I, ge I genuinely loved it. I found it probably one of the most useful. Um, just courses I've ever taken ever. Um, instructors are great, very hands-on, very approachable. TAs are usually alumni or full-time and they, their time is absolutely incredible. Like it, it, they're incredible to utilize as a resource for, hey, I don't understand why something works even after we went over it for nine hours. Um, all of them are very smart, all of them very passionate. Most of them are already employed and have been in the software engineering field for years so they have practical experience to fall back on and you don't even have to ask them just about the course you can ask them about job market or hey what'd you do to start out there's such a wealth of knowledge going through co platoon 
that if you're even remotely interested in a, an engine and a software engineering or full stack engineering uh, prospect or uh, prospect of your future, uh, you would be doing yourself a disservice by not doing it. it. It's fascinating to me looking at it kind of, you know, from the front end of this organization, I've asked now, I don't know how many people I've asked who are graduates of Code Platoon, that same question and how many times and how common the two words do it come up in that, in that answer. Like it, it, it is universal. Everyone I've asked has said, now they have a little bit longer answer just like you did, but the preface of that answer is always do it, like just do it. And so I, yeah. it makes me proud as a, as a member of the organization to hear that from everybody I've talked to going through the, you know, coming through the, the program and to reflect back on the instructors as well. And everyone comments on the, the professionalism of the instructors, which is super great to hear. It just, like I said, it makes me proud. So transitioning totally less serious because we've only got a couple minutes left. I asked two questions of everybody. First question is, uh, do you listen to music when you're working? And if so, what do you listen to? It's either music or a podcast. Uh, I listen to, if it's music, I listen to a lot of indie music, indie pop, or it's uh, video game metal music. Uh, I, listen, I found it on deployment, it helped me work out. And it's just a bunch of video, video game background music with okay. metal covers on top. Love it to bits. Uh, <laughs> podcast, I listen to Darknet Diaries with Jack Recyter. Have to, I'm a nerd. And I listen to Creepcast, which is uh, two YouTubers who talk about like horror stories and creepy pastas from the internet and love them all. Fantastic. There's a there's a common theme. And I, I asked this question because the first episode we did of this was with former musicians turned software engineers. So people who were actual military band members and then became software engineers because we've had a lot of people. I don't know if you know that or not, but we've had a, a number of people come through from military bands like Navy band, Army band. Like it's crazy disproportionate because they don't make up a huge portion of the military, but we've had a lot of them come through. None of them listen to music while they while they work. None because it's too distracting. So nope. I need something. <laughs> I need I need something to clear out the rings or just to keep my mind moving. Right, right. So final question, final question. Uh, uh, even you know, probably even less serious. Favorite movie and or show from the last two years. Uh, favorite show has to be Righteous Gemstones. Um phenomenal hilarious uh it's very it's fairly dry humor but i've been enjoying it. i've been binging it the past couple weeks uh yeah the past couple weeks all right up to season three um i actually also fell into dexter mm, from, okay. like from 2005 i just i just started watching it and i know my mom used to love it classic <laughs> her, she recorded on her tivo and all that stuff that and charmed all the time um so i found out on netflix i was like i'm gonna give it a watch i'm actually really enjoying that one too so i think those two uh favorite movie would be the new deadpool movie mm. genuinely laughed my butt off um zero complaints enjoyed every second of it and i hate superhero movies with a passion so <laughs> take that for what you will I hear very good things. I haven't seen it yet, but I hear very good things about it. I'm sure. I'm sure that I will. It takes a lot to get me to the theater, so I'm sure I'll see yeah, it. Yeah, this it's is streaming, but uh, this is a good recommendation. That I want to see Twisters really badly because I've always had a fascination with tornadoes. We will end up. I personally, in my house, we will end up owning that one because my wife is a huge disaster movie fan, and she she has watched the original Twisters no less than a hundred times, so she can quote it verbatim. So I promise you that I'll end up owning that via Amazon as soon as it's available. It'll it'll be in our in our catalog for sure. Any final thoughts that you have in our remaining four minutes? Uh I guess my only final thought is do it. Stop thinking about it and just do it. <laughs> Whether it's co platoon or engineering, the more you think about it, the more you're going to make yourself nervous. Just pull the trigger, get going. You don't quit or you don't fail uh you don't fail because you don't do you don't succeed in what you want. You fail because you quit. So get out that's there. Don't great. fail. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree with all the people I've seen come through code platoon. If you want it, you'll do it. And uh, yeah. We, and the support is there for you. If you want to do this, the support is there to help make it happen. Well, Jose, it was great to talk to you again. I know that uh, it's been a little while since we chatted, so it was great to get back in touch with you. It's always good to see alumni who are doing well and excited about what they're doing. 
And I am greatly appreciative of your willingness to jump on here and have a conversation about this stuff because a lot of it is these are questions that people have. These are genuine questions that I can't ask answer fully because I don't do it. And so I love having the opportunity to talk to people in your position who can speak to the experiential aspect of it, which I think is huge. So I am very grateful for you being on this with me and doing this, this program. Um, if somebody wants to talk to Jose more, get in touch with me. I'm not going to hand out his email to everybody, but if you, if you email me, greg at codeplatoon.org and you're serious and you have some, some legit questions for Jose, I'll put you in touch. Absolutely. And we'll make that happen. But, uh, Jose, again, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And, uh, this has been another episode of Veteran Voices in Code. I'm your host, Greg Drobny, at, at the recruiter at Code Platoon. Again, you can email me, greg at codeplatoon.org. Or if you email the info at codeplatoon.org email, it'll come to me as well. So uh, I look forward to hearing from anyone out there who wants to know more. I'm happy to talk about exactly that. So thanks for joining us today, Jose. Thanks again. And we'll uh, we'll see you soon, I hope. Yeah, thanks for having me, Greg. Thank you.